Okay. This is where we left off, right? Uh, the last, this was the last slide that I had shown, um, and basically <clears throat> uh, showing how uh, there were two different um, bone cell lines. Uh, the first was the one uh, that goes from osteoprogenitor to osteoblast to osteocyte. Um, and then the second was uh, this uh, line from megakaryocytes that gives rise uh, to the osteoclast. All right. So and I talked about that first uh, line, and then today I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about osteoclast uh, themselves. So uh, they're bone dissolving cells. They dissolve the dense bony matrix um, of dense bone um, in the osteons. Uh, they're found on the surface uh, of the bone in the uh, medullary cavity. And they, they come from blood cells. Their origin is from, uh, they have the same uh, embryologic origin as uh, your blood cells. So uh, when they fuse together, uh, it's they, there's going to be an, a couple examples throughout the semester where a functional cell type that we talk about uh, comes from the fusion of multiple cells. And one of them, yes? So, so erythrocytes or other kinds of blood cells? Uh, so they don't develop from erythrocytes, but they have a common, they have, there's a common origin that, that they all have. Um, uh, for example, muscle cells, uh, we'll see skeletal muscle cells, also uh, form from a fusion of uh, multiple uh, stem cells. So uh, they can have up to 50 nuclei and can be quite large. Uh, so when we remodel a bone, uh, what, so I guess before I, I say this, um, in the anatomy lab, when you're in the anatomy lab and you're looking at the osteology of the skeleton, looking at a certain bone and looking at the osseous features of that bone, you'll notice things like various ridges or uh, bumps called tubercles uh, that result from the action of a muscle attaching to that bone and with time pulling on that bone. Uh, that tubercle grew, that bony ridge, that bump, that lump, etc., uh, grew on that bone uh, because of the combined tension of the muscle and then the action of the osteoblasts and osteoclasts remodeling that bone, breaking bone down and then uh, building it up, okay? So this remodeling of the bone uh, with time results from uh, the, co the combination of action of these two cells. Um, osteoclasts are breaking down bone matrix and osteoblasts uh, are helping to build it up. And what is this uh, matrix of the bone? Well, about a third of it is organic in nature. And when I say organic, I mean uh, carbon-based, um, mostly proteins. And the largest protein of which uh, is one of the collagens. There's multiple forms of collagen in the body uh, depending upon what tissue that collagen is found in. Um, and then there are three different carbohydrate protein uh, complexes. You know what? I just realized that I must have taken that slide out. I had a nice slide about glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans, and I, I realized I must have removed it. It's too bad. Um, so collagen and the, then these uh, proteins or glycosylated protein complexes where the protein forms some sort of uh, thin core, some fil filamentous core, and then it's decorated uh, with these uh, different uh, carbohydrates. Uh, so then uh, the, the glycosaminoglycans, the GAGs, various pl proteoglycans and, uh, and sundry glycoproteins. Two-thirds of the remaining uh, dry weight of the bone, thank you, is uh, inorganic. And
and uh, that means it's made up of various inorganic salts. Uh, the, the primary one being this stuff called hydroxyapatite. 85% of uh, the uh, inorganic content of the bone matrix is, is, is hydroxyapatite. And we see it's a, it's a relatively complex ceramic uh, structure containing calcium and phosphate. Um, another 10% is uh, calcium carbonate. A very simple calcium carbonate. And then there are uh, some trace elements uh, found, trace inorganic elements found in the bone. So the, you know, the magnesium, etc., that you uh, will have, there's some others that aren't actually listed there, um, are important to have in your diet in, in small quantities. So uh, here we have depiction of collagen, about a third of it, and then this is a model uh, showing what hydroxyapatite's three-dimensional structure looks like, and you can probably appreciate that it has a fairly uh, complex um, structure. It, it's, a, it's crystalline in nature, it's a, a crystal structure, and uh, is, is quite rigid. These are very strong uh, covalent bonds that hold this structure together. All right, so the bone itself inside the medullary cavity of a bone, uh, it's, it's filled with marrow. And uh, this marrow cavity, this is uh, the soft tissue, um, is found in both long bones and in flat bones. Um, and there is a distinction between the type of marrow found in either of these uh, two bone types. So when you think about the skeleton, uh, that slide is pretty washed out for some reason. Maybe if I close this, you'll be able to see it better. And those of you who don't want to pay attention to fall asleep more easily. There we go. Is that better? Uh, you can talk about the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. That's the way it's the, the first rough uh, division of the skeleton. So the axial skeleton are the bones that lie along um, the, the central axis of the body. And these include the cranium, the spinal column, the ribs, uh, the sacrum, and the pelvic girdle. That, that's the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton are uh, the parts of the skeleton that are in your appendages, appendicular, your appendages. And these include the upper arms, the upper extremity, the arms, and uh, the legs, the lower extremity. So tends to be that flat bones are located in the axial skeleton. So like the ribs, the uh, cranium, uh, the jaw, the pelvis, um, etc. And these long bones with more round, hollow uh, medullary cavities are found in the uh, appendicular skeleton. It's these long uh, bones with the uh, round medullary cavity that's full of yellow marrow, and then the flatter bones are full of red uh, marrow. Red marrow is so named because my wife is saying, well, sorry, can I have a yeah, sorry, think about that for a moment. Nice to get a visit. Um, so um, I was saying, yeah, red marrow is the site of erythropoiesis, the production of red blood cells. Um, yeah, it's a hemopoietic uh, tissue, meaning it's it's giving rise uh, to red blood cells. And um, in children. This is everywhere in your body because you're growing and you need to be uh, consistently increasing the volume of blood as the volume of your body is going up. 
Then once your body uh, maintains uh, a, a, stable, uh, a stable size, uh, a lot of the red marrow that once was in the appendicular skeleton becomes uh, yellow, just gets replaced by uh, adipose tissue. And the red marrow that is in the axial skeleton is uh, enough along with the spleen for uh, erythropoiesis. Okay, so now on to calcium homeostasis. This is what I, uh, the, the main point of the lecture today. So there are three primary hormones that are going to control uh, calcium homeostasis. We'll, uh, I, when we get into the endocrine chapter, we'll talk about a lot more hormones. Um, but here is a, a little bit of a, an introduction to it. And these are calcitriol, calcitonin, and parathyroid hormone, which usually has an E on the end of hormone. Um, and the action of these three hormones uh, is via uh, three different tissues. These are the bones, which is where calcium is being deposited. This is the primary repository of calcium. We said in a, uh, the previous lecture that 99% of the calcium in the body, that 1.1 kilogram of uh, calcium that is in most adults, uh, is found in, in the bones. Secondly, in the digestive tract, you, you guys could probably have intuited these three tissue types, uh, right? So there's a, you need a place to store it. We need a way to get it into the body. That is the digestive tract, and so we absorb calcium through there, and it's the action of these hormones that's going to affect that. And then we're going to get rid of it, too. We're going to excrete it when we need to, and that's going to happen at the kidneys, all right? So... Uh, calcium is, uh, is water-soluble, so it's removed from the body via uh, the urine. Um, and when we look at what's going on here, we have uh, the parathyroid glands, which are going to make parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone is going to descend and have action uh, on the kidneys, uh, where we're going to increase calcium reabsorption. Uh, we're going to go through all this in detail. This is just an overview uh, right now. In fact, you're going to see about six different schematics all saying the same thing. Uh, so uh, there's parathyroid hormone is helping calcium resorption in the kidneys and uh, resorption of vitamin D um, from the kidneys, so preventing it from being excreted. Uh, the kidneys are then uh, pumping out uh, the 1,2,5-hydroxy vitamin D which are going to affect calcium absorption in t intestines and, uh, and in the bones. This is going to lead to an increase in calcium in the blood, which is going to have a negative feedback loop on the parathyroid hormones. All right, so that's, that's the basic homeostatic loop. We're going to go through it in much more detail, so keep your hats on. All right, one uh, hormone at a time starting with calcitonin. So say you have uh, elevated serum levels of calcium. Uh, what did I say the reference range was? 9.4 to 10.2, something like that, deciliters per uh, milligrams per deciliter. I think that was what the, I might have the units wrong, but I think that's the units that I, I had given you. Um, so uh, we have excess calcium in the blood. Calcitonin uh, gets secreted, and it's going to have two actions. First of all, calcitonin has a direct uh, effect on osteoclasts, right? It's going to downregulate uh, osteoclast activity. So less of the bone is getting uh, resorbed. Less of the bone is getting worn away and increased osteoblast activity. So more bone is going to get deposited. This is, calcitonin, in general, leads to an increase in uh, bone density and mass. Okay? You guys follow that? And when that happens, we return the blood uh, calcium levels to normal, and that will downregulate -reg calcitonin uh, secretion. 
Um, so calcitonin is secreted by the thyroid. There are these C cells in the thyroid, um, or C standing for clear cells, not calcitonin cells. Uh, it's a histological uh, distinction. So uh, here's just a, a similar diagram to this one over here. We have uh, calcitonin that's too high, uh, above 11 milligrams per deciliter. I guess I got the, the numbers right. Um, so uh, this is going to lead to decreased PTH or calcitriol. Uh, we'll get to that. That's going to affect the intestines. But uh, calcitonin is going to allow uh, calcium to be excreted in the urine. We ta I just talked about the effect on osteoclasts, the downregulation of osteoclasts, and the upregulation of osteoblasts. And then uh, it's also going to allow more uh, calcium to pass out of the urine. All right. So what you need to know here, it seems like there's a lot of moving parts in this, but all you really need to, to keep in your mind is what osteoclasts do. They dissolve bone. They take stored calcium, they dissolve it and put it in the blood. What osteoblasts do, which is take calcium that's in the blood and then they store it as new bone. You need to know the function of those two cell types. And then you just need to know uh, what are the conditions under which uh, calcitonin is being released. Right? So when you have high calcium in the blood, you're going to release calcitonin, and that's going to bring the tonicity of the calcium in the blood. It's hypertonic calcium. It's going to bring the tonicity of the calcium in the blood back down to the reference range. Okay? And just imagine how it's going to do that. Okay? You'll, it, it should make sense, then, that if calcitonin is taking calcium out of the blood, it's going to do that via the osteoblasts, and you're going to want to slow down the osteoclasts. Okay? So remember what the two cell types do, and know why you would excrete calcitonin, and you'll be able to figure out everything else. It, and then it'll also make sense that calcitonin is going to allow some of the calcium to pass out of the body via the kidneys. Okay? You can kind of uh, derive the actions just by knowing why you're going to excrete it and what the moving part and what the, the key players are, what their general functions are. All right. Um, so that's calcitonin. On the other hand, there is parathyroid hormone and calcitriol. So working together. They're the other side of the coin, the other side of the coin. And uh, I'll say that um, it is, uh, in terms of the general health of the, of the public, we have uh, physiologies that are skewed towards this situation and, and not the other, not uh, needing a lot of calcitonin, right? So... Uh, let's, let's talk about this. Parathyroid hormone is meant to raise your, your serum levels of calcium when you uh, become hypocalcemic. Hypocalcemic, not enough calcium in the blood. So uh, there's a deficiency of calcium. We're down below the 9.4 uh, milligrams per deciliter uh, target range that I had mentioned. And so parathyroid is going to get pumped out by the parathyroid glands. These are little um, lentil-shaped uh, a, a, a quartet of little lentil-shaped um, tissue, endocrine tissue, on the backside of the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland is a kind of a butterfly-shaped gland that's right below your thyroid cartilage, and the thyroid, parathyroid glands are right behind it. Very small <laughs> tissue with a very profound effect on your, uh, on your physiology. So the parathyroid uh, hormone comes out, and it's going to have these different effects. First of all, they're going to turn up the osteoclasts. They're going to turn up the osteoclasts. Um, so that means we're going to take calcium out of storage. We're going to dissolve some bone. We're going to take calcium out of the storage, leading to, and then also, 
we're going to turn down the activity of the osteoblasts, the things that um, store calcium as bone. So we get more bone, bone resorption or dissolving into the blood uh, and less bone deposition, leading to a net decrease in bone density and mass, a net increase in the liberation of calcium that had been tied up as hydroxyapatite, okay? But it also has uh, these effects on uh, the urinary system. So there's going to be more urinary phosphate excretion and less urinary calcium excretion. So, and I'll explain this in a moment. Uh, we're going to reserve calcium, okay, reserve calcium. So the convoluted tubules, the distal convoluted tubules of the, uh, of the kidneys are going to, those transporters in those cells, uh, epithelial cells, are going to uh, pull back, re resorb more of the calcium, excrete less of it. There's going to be less calcium in your urine, um, and that's going to help prop up the blood circulating levels. Uh, but also, we're going to actually unload phosphate. We're going to unload phosphate. And the, and the result here is not just that we're saving calcium, but importantly, what we're doing is changing the calcium phosphate ratio in the blood. We're changing the calcium phosphate ratio. And this is just pure stoichiometry. This is pure stoichiometry where uh, the, the stoichiometry relating to the formation of hydroxyapatite. Okay, and if you throw off that stoichiometry, you're going to have a harder time forming uh, hydroxyapatite. Uh, and also, so further undermining bone deposition. That's that's this part of the loop right there. All of that is going to serve to bring the circulating levels of calcium from the 9 or less uh, milligrams per deciliter up into the, the reference range for a healthy homeostasis. So um, calcitriol is the primary effector of intestinal absorption, although PTH has a minor effect that's not included in this uh, uh, diagram, and it's going to have its effect of retaining uh, calcium in the kidneys, as I said, and um, and then the osteoclasts are going to be turned on, and uh, bone is going to be resorbed. All right, calcitriol, uh, along with parathyroid hormone. Calcitriol is utilized when there is low plasma calcium concentrations. So how do we get to calcitriol? Here it is. Calcitriol takes a long synthetic, biosynthetic pathway in many tissues in the body before we get to the active uh, hormone here, the, the the calcitriol that's going to have its effect on, uh, on the gut that's going to promote absorption of calcium from all that delicious milk and dairy products and uh, what else do you eat that has lots of calcium in it? I guess your kale is going to have lots of calcium for you. Chalk. Uh, yeah, for those people who like to eat chalk for breakfast. So uh, how do we get uh, calcitriol? We start with cholesterol. Cholesterol. And so uh, you'll notice that the, the word cholesterol and calcitriol uh, have some of the same letters in them. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that'll help you. <laughs> uh, cholesterol that's in the skin gets converted by uh, UV light. Uh, it's UVB light near UV um, I think I have a slide that will talk about that in a moment. Uh, it gets converted to vitamin D3, and this is the good stuff. Vitamin D3 is um, not just involved in the absorption of calcium, but yes. Uh, are all of these steroid hormones, or are any of these, um, what's it called, uh, globular protein hormones? 
Oh, the parathyroid hormone you're talking about. Uh, parathyroid hormone, I think, is a peptide hormone. I actually don't remember off the top of my head. That's, that's a good question. We'll come to that. I'll remind myself uh, for you at some point here. But um, vitamin D3 is a steroid hormone that is uh, fat-soluble. And uh, it is deficient, and we're going to talk about uh, rickets and how it's deficient in uh, a few slides. But um, D3 goes to the liver uh, from the skin or the, the uh, dietary sources, and the liver converts it to calcidiol uh, by, um, by hydroxylating this, uh, this uh, carbon in that aromatic ring right there, and uh, that's how we get calcitriol. All right. So your, I have this thing here. It says calcium homeostasis depends on a balance between dietary intake, urinary, and fecal losses and exchanges between osseous tissues. That's the take-home message I'm, I'm trying to get, give you from, from all of this. Yeah? What's the organ that changes the uh, That's the kidney. Yeah, it happens in the kidney. All right. So... I added this slide last night when I was watching the football game or not watching the football game. Um, just some sources of vitamin D3. And I thought this was useful because um, we live in a northerly clime and we don't get a whole lot of UVB radiation in the wintertime up here. So people in uh, high latitudes have a higher tendency towards... Um, UVB or, or D3 deficiencies. Probably none of you because you eat in the dining halls and you're probably getting uh, a balanced meal. And even in the United States, it's pretty hard to find someone with a D3 deficiency because we now supplement milk with vitamin D. Um, but uh, it has been a real health concern in the past, uh, particularly for people that live in the north. So our primary source of vitamin D Three, uh, cholecalciferol, is from sunlight, this near uh, UVB. So right in here, here's the visible spectrum, uh, here's UV radiation, and uh, here's the UVB. This is the stuff that usually gets taken out by uh, the ozone, really high energy. This is definitely bad. Uh, this stuff gets through no problem. Uh, so this is usually what the source of skin cancer is. Uh, for most people. Um, and right here, this UVB uh, is in constant. You have to be in the middle of the day to really be uh, getting UVB to penetrate through the atmosphere uh, and absorb it. But a little bit of sunshine every day, 10 minutes, it should be more than enough to get all the vitamin D3 in the three major seasons. And then in the winter, you just live off your fat stores of vitamin D3. Uh, it also can be found in fish, cod liver oil, sardines, salmon. What a delicious way to get your vitamin D3. Mackerel is very good if you eat it fresh out of the ocean, which is easy to do here in Maine. Uh, tuna has some. Uh, and then <clears throat> dairy products, milk, eggs, uh, yogurt. Yeah? Uh, what do cave... This is sort of a random question because this is human physiology, so I'm not expecting you to know this, but do you happen to know the solution that cave dwelling in deep sea vertebrates use uh, to get their vitamin D? Most cave time. dwelling and deep sea inhabitants. Well, okay. Um, I can't answer that one. Deep sea, I'm not sure. But uh, there, there's a lot of D3 in the food chain in the ocean, so I'm, I'm assuming that is one. And then cave dwellers, you know, <laughs> that's... It's a hard life. I'm not really sure where cave dwellers are getting their D3. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't answer that one. Uh, but you can, maybe from mushrooms. Maybe that's it. They're in the cave. They're getting it from mushrooms. That's an answer. I'm sorry. It's a good, good question. I, I, don't, I don't actually have the answer to that. Um, but you can get plenty of D out of a mushroom. So maybe that was, that's the answer. All right. So what happens if you don't get enough, though? Uh, you get 
Uh, one, there's a, there's a number of um, diseases, the most uh, notable of which is rickets. Um, <clears throat> rickets has been mostly uh, eliminated here in the Western world. Uh, you don't see it uh, very much in North America um, nowadays. But it is, it is uh, prevalent in other places in the world. Um, so this is a uh, lack of vitamin D3 in, in the diet or from external sources leads to poorly formed bones. Uh, if you, this is just a, a, a sample. If you go on Google Image, you can sort of melt your mind with the uh, wavy looking uh, bodies that these poor children have. It was uh, first um, described, not explicitly, uh, but first recognized that there was a nutritional problem that led to bone uh, malformation by this guy, Serranus of uh, Ephesus, in, who was a, a Greek beholden to the Roman captors uh, in the first century A.D., uh, he subscri subscribed to this methodic uh, process of, of medicine, uh, which you can look it up if you're interested in him. I have to take the time. But uh, then it was uh, more formally described in the 17th century, uh, but it wasn't until uh, the 19th century uh, by this guy here, Kurt Holshinsky, I hope I'm saying that right, that he figured out that you could treat rickets uh, with UV light. And this guy was pretty interesting. He was uh, a German that was in Germany during World War I. And there was, at the time, uh, they believed that 50% of German children had some degree of vitamin D3 deficiency. Rickets was rampant throughout Germany at the time. And it was a major, major health problem. The war is in incredibly, war is a horrible, destructive thing, of course. Um, and so he discovered that he could treat rickets by exposing these children, these people, to uh, UV light. And so here's an example of this. This man was, uh, he's really, a pretty interesting life story he eventually escaped Germany uh, and fled to Egypt where there was no shortage of sunlight for him and lived out his life uh, there with his medical studies, but uh, kind of an interesting character. All right. So here is all of it kind of put together in one diagram, and we'll have a couple of these. Um, so we have, uh, here's our circulating calcium. Oh, the numbers are 9, 2 to 10, 4. I just had the numbers, the decimals off. So this is our reference range, okay? And uh, some of it is going to get filtered out by the kidneys, and some of it is going to be resorbed by, uh, some of that which will be resorbed. Not all of it, some of it is going to pass into the urine. This is controlled uh, by calcitriol and uh, weekly or uh, weekly by calcitriol and mostly by uh, parathyroid hormone. Um, then there's the digestive tract. So we're eating about 1,000 milligrams uh, per day. And about a gram of calcium a day is what your body uh, would like to have. Um, so a gram, just to put that into context, a penny is about five grams, so a fifth of a penny. That is the mass of calcium that you should be trying to get in your, your diet every day. Uh, so what is that? 650 milligrams of that is, is typically what's absorbed, uh, but that can fluctuate depending upon the action of calcitriol. The rest of it is lost in the feces. So between the urinary loss of 650 and the fecal loss of 350, that is approximately uh, the, the gram per day that you need to consume. Then on the other side of, of it, uh, on the storage side of it, we're going we're gonna to have deposition by uh, osteoblasts as hydroxyapatite uh, under the effect of calcitonin and resorption by osteoclasts 
uh, under the control of calcitriol and parathyroid hormone. And here's the same, the same thing, just a different way. So showing uh, the two loops, uh, the homeostatic loops combined. So what happens if it's above or below that target range? Uh, again, falling blood levels of calcium parathyroid hormone turns on, stimulates calcium release from the bones uh, via osteoclast, and stimulates uptake in the kidneys. All right, so we're going to absorb more uh, from uh, the urine. And then uh, it also is, those kidneys will then uh, produce the uh, D3, which will, uh, will, will convert D3 uh, to the calcitriol, which is going to increase uh, the uptake in the intestines. That's all going to save, uh, serve to raise the blood uh, levels. And then on the other side, uh, we're going to have rising uh, blood calcium levels in uh, is going to lead the thyroid to release calcitonin. Calcitonin is going to act on both the kidneys and the bones, and it's going to bring uh, the calcium back down to the reference range. Pretty straightforward. This puts it all together. If you can sort of absorb what's happening in this diagram, I think you'll get the, the bulk of what I talked about today. All right, now a few slides about some... Pathology, osteoporosis. Does anybody in this room have uh, a family member that has osteoporosis? Yeah, probably many of you do, I would, I would guess. Um, so osteoporosis is uh, the gradual uh, resorption of too much bone leading to pores in the bone, uh, a loss of bone density. So here would be normal bone, and here is the trabeculae uh, of... Uh, spongy bone after it's been osteoporotically uh, degraded. So this affects 8.9, oh no, this leads to 8.9 million fractures uh, in the world uh, every year. That's one fracture every three seconds. So one uh, presumably older person is breaking either their spine, their hip, or their wrist uh, every three seconds. Those are the, the primary places uh, where, where we're going to see osteoporotic uh, fracture. Um, that is 240 million women worldwide. 240 million women worldwide. That's a pretty big number considering, let me think about that, there are about 4 billion women. So 240 million is about... Uh, one sixteenth of the female population of all women on the planet, and it's a lot. But as you work up the age structure, that's one in ten women that are age sixty. Uh, one in five, age seventy. Two in five women, uh, aged eighty. And now, if you get to, if you make it to ninety, good work. Uh, chances are you have osteoporosis, though. So. You've been living almost half your life uh, postmenopausally, and we'll talk about why that matters. Yes, sir. Uh, when you say osteoporosis forms, is it too much uh, bone being created? No, no, too much bone is being uh, dissolved. It's overactive osteoclasts, and we'll, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, so just hold on. Um, yeah, so they say by 2020, by the time the next election rolls around, there will be 61 million uh, people in the U.S. with uh, osteoporosis. That's a lot, folks. That's, that's one-fifth of the U.S. population, maybe one-fourth by 2020. I don't know what the population is going to be of the U.S. by then, but that's still a lot of people. Um, all right, so estrogen is what maintains uh, bone density in both males and females. All right, uh, it is going to inhibit re uh, resorption by osteoclasts. All right, it it kind of keeps the lid on an on osteoclast. We didn't talk about uh, the role of estrogen in uh, in calcium homeostasis because it it doesn't play 
a, a tremendous role normally. Like you don't have fluctuating estrogen levels that are helping to maintain uh, circulating calcium levels. That's not the that's not the intention. It does have direct effect on the osteoclasts, and when you go postmenopausal and your estrogen levels fall off a cliff, you go from this uh, to this. All right, and so you can see where the, it's it's pitted. The, this these pitted trabeculae uh, leads to kyphosis, to a weakening of the spinal column, the body of the vertebral bodies. And uh, you get this uh, kyphotic um, deconvolution of the vertebral cobble. Yeah. So are male osteoclasts uh, um, more? I knew you were going to ask that question. Because, uh, like, in regular healthy adults and pre, uh, adult men and premenopausal women, you know, the, the bone density is. The difference here, is, and, and this is like a, a broader discussion about androgens that I want to get into right now, but um, the difference is in men, you do not have uh, the, the, the profound fluctuations in, in expressed estrogen levels that you do in, a women, uh, in women. So uh, women go into menarche and then, uh, and then menopause, and so they have this profound drop in their estrogen levels that men do not have. Uh, so men's, the relationship between uh, their circulating estrogen, estrogenic and androgenic hormones and osteoclast activity does not vary in the same way that it does in women. And that, let's leave it at that. Is that? Okay, so the, the change is more important than the net actual estrogen concentration. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. And so here is, I put this in last night. Uh, hopefully I, I don't get in over my head with just five minutes remaining. Uh, but <clears throat> one, so one of the primary uh, ways of, the strategies of dealing with osteoporosis is uh, by thinking about the role of estrogen. So estrogen doesn't just have its action on osteoclasts. It also affects both osteocytes and osteoblasts in these uh, ways listed uh, here. So the question is, how can we uh, deal with the loss of estrogen in these postmenopausal women? Well, one of them is this estrogen uh, replacement therapy. And this uh, has been a very successful a way of, of dealing with this problem. It does have its drawbacks, however. Um, it's going to slow the bone resorption, all right? So that uh, increases apoptosis in the osteoclasts and is going to decrease apoptosis in the osteoblast and osteocytes. So uh, on, on this side, that's going to help uh, form more bone. It's going to lead to more bone remodeling, and it's going to uh, decrease the bone uh, dissolution. Uh, there are some other... Uh, drugs, there's uh, Fosamax, uh, Aptonil, uh, that lead to the destruction of osteoclasts, but also you can get this uh, particularly uh, mandibular osteonecrosis. This is bone death, uh, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a pretty sight. So there are some uh, side effects to some of these drugs. They are, uh, they can be effective at preventing osteoporosis in, uh, in the bones. There can be, um, you can have parathyroid hormone uh, injections on a daily basis and keeping a basic tonic level of pH, of PTH. Uh, there are a lot of side effects to this. All three of these, all of these chemical approaches are gonna have drawbacks to them. The best thing you can do is prevention. This is for all of you, but particularly the women in the room. Prevention is the best thing you can do. Exercise and diet, especially, especially now, between the ages of 25 and 40. What you do with your life now for the next 20 years is going to have as profound of effect as possible on what your life is like from 60 and older compared to what you do in your life then. So it's how you live your life, the choices you make in your life now, getting exercise, eating the right kind of nutrition um, that 
are going to lead to lifelong um, bone health and are going to reduce your risk for uh, crippling osteoporosis. Because just looking at the statistics I put on the other slide uh, here and assuming uh, longevity curves the way they're going, um, so there's two, four, six, seven females in the classroom, uh, you know, that means maybe five of you, if you live, four or five of you can plan on having osteoporosis unless you take, uh, you know, some proactive steps to reduce the likelihood of that. So there's that. Um, I might have banged that drum a little bit hard there. So uh, exercise, hormones, and nutrition. Um, I, would, I would love to get a, have a chance to talk about this, but I, I actually have to leave. My son is vomiting, apparently. Um, but heavily stressed bones, weight-bearing exercise. Weight-bearing exercise is uh, a one way to help bones become thicker and stronger. All right, you increase bone density by having weight-bearing exercise. Um, and I said I have this here. Up to one third of bone mass can be lost in in just a few weeks of inactivity. So. You put that uh, bone in a cast, you cash out on the couch uh, for a month, and you can, you can lose significant bone density. Oops. Um, yeah, the, this is just talking about sources of different vitamins. We're done. This is the last slide. I'll let you out. I'm sorry. I'm a minute or two late. Uh, I wanted to make the point that Looking at circulate, serum levels of uh, parathyroid hormone and plasma calcium can be indicative of different disease states. So here's the normal range. Um, if you look at calcium levels in conjunction with parathyroid hormone, you can separate whether a person's in renal failure or whether they have hypoparathyroidism. Conversely, you can uh, distinguish uh, hypercalcemia from primary hyperthyroidism. Uh, say you're high plasma calcium, but you have low uh, PTH, it's going to be hypercalcemia due to cancer versus if you had high PTH, you'd have high uh, hyperparathyroidism. All right, so looking at the, the, the combination of uh, PTH and the plasma and calcium can be an, a powerful diagnostic tool. That's all. I was just going to talk about this disease, but for nothing but your own interest. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay. Good. Have a lovely day, please. Are you guys getting enough sleep? Did you guys get some sleep this weekend? Okay. Yes? Sort of? Good. Get a little exercise. Get a little exercise. Do some yoga. You can come to my yoga class on Wednesday if you want. You need, you need some of that in your life.